<laughs> Hello class, in this video we will be covering 9.1, sampling, frequency distribution, and graphs. There are 15 problems in this section. Number one says the government of a large city needs to determine whether the city's residents will support the building of a new middle school. The government decides to conduct a survey of a sample of the city's residents. Which of the following procedures would be the most appropriate for obtaining a sample of the city's residents? So the first option is survey a random sample of adults who currently have children in public schools. And the thing is, is which public schools? The public schools in the city? Not only that, not all of the adults in the city, not all of the residents are gonna have children. So that's not a true representation of all the, the residents. It's just the representations of all the parents that are, that are um, residents. The second option is every third person who walks into a local grocery store. Yes, it's a local grocery store, but you could have passerby. I can't say that word. People who are passing by or passing through the city. Um, so are all the customers actually from the city? Would that be inappropriate? Uh, what about those that are not able to go to the grocery shop, go to the grocery store? Then you're not getting an equal representation of all the residents for those that are not even able to go to the grocery store. Okay, so that would not be um, a good representation of the city's residents. Third option is survey the last 100 residents listed in the telephone directory. Again, not all the residents would be in the telephone directory. That is something that you have to volunteer to do. So that wouldn't be a good representation representation of the whole uh, city's residents. And then the last one is survey a random sample of persons within each geographical region of the city. Now that would make more sense. One, it's random, so you're getting a representation from randomly selected people. So you could get anyone whether they be a parent, whether they shop at the grocery store, whether they're listed in the phone directory or not, okay? Um, and as long as you're doing it by the geographical regions of the city, then you're getting, um, piece, you're getting representation from each part of the city. So that would be the best option. Okay, moving on to number two, it says, a questionnaire was given to students. The first question asked was, how stressed have you been in the last week on a scale of zero to 10? With zero being not stressed at all and 10 being as stressed as possible. The responses are shown to the right. Um, which stress rating describes the greatest number of students? So here's the stress rating, zero through 10. And here's the number of people who chose these particular ratings, okay? Now, out of all the people, this number seems to be the highest, which means eight is the most popular. So it says, which stress rating describes the greatest number of students? It would be eight out of 10. And then how many students responded with this rating? There were 31 students that responded with that rating. For number three, it says a professor had students keep track of their social interactions for a week. The number of social interactions over the week is shown in the following group frequency distribution. Identify the lower limit of the fifth class. So I went through, this is the first class, the second class, third class, fourth class, fifth class. And the lower limit, which means the lower end of where the class begins is 25. So that's the value that I put here. Now, number four says a professor had students keep track of their social interactions for a week. The number of social interactions over the week is shown in the following grouped frequency distribution. Uh, what is the class width? Okay, so between here and here, that's 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. And so it's actually 38 in there. And you can even do it with any one of these because they should all have the same width. So 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119. I still get the same width and it's nine. So there are nine um, values within that group or within that class. 
So number five says, a professor had students keep track of their social interactions for a week. The number of social interactions over the week is shown in the group frequency distribution to the right. Among the classes with the greatest frequency, which class has the least number of social interactions? So these all seem to be the three groups with the greatest frequency. Um, which class has the least number of social interactions? Um, this one has the least number of social interactions. So it would be 10 to 14. Now, number six says, as of 2011, the following age are ages at which the country's presidents were inaugurated. And so they have the whole list out there. It says, construct a grouped frequency distribution for the data. Use 41 through 45 for the first class and use the same width for each subsequent class. So they already had the chart for me. I just had to basically count how many were in this age group, how many were in that age group, and so on and so forth. So the way I did it was to use different symbols. I didn't want to X them out because then you wouldn't know where I got which ones from. So the first thing is, did I circled all the ages between 41 and 45, including 41 and 45? So you see that I circled all of those guys, okay? And then once I circled them, I just counted how many there were and I put that frequency in here. Then the next thing I did was underline all of the ages that were 46 to 50. And then I counted how many I underlined and there were four. Then I boxed 51 through 55 and I counted how many boxes there were and there were five. Then I did kind of like this little curved un underlining uh, for 56 through 60 and I counted them, there were six. Then I did these little like top hats, like they're like the carrot button in your calculator for an exponent. So I did a top hat for 61 through 65 and I counted them, there were 12. And then finally I did like a mustache up top, just like a little squiggly thing up top for 66 to 70. And then I counted them, there were seven of those. So you could use different symbols if you have color pencils or, you know, you can use that. Um, if you're writing them down on paper and you're just crossing them out, you could do that too. Just count them as you cross them. So that way you know how many you have. But that is it for number six. For number seven, it says, students were asked how stressed have you been in the last week on a scale of one to 10, with zero not being stressed at all and 10 being stressed as stressed as possible. The students' responses are shown in the frequency distribution below. Construct a histogram and frequency polygon for the data. So for these, I like to go on the ends. So I make sure that the first numbers are correct. So for a stress rating of zero, I should have a frequency of three. If this is 10, this is five, three should be here, but I don't have a box right there for zero. It's just nothing. So it's definitely not this option. Here, the box should only be this high, not all the way up there. So it wasn't this one. And then this one, same thing. The box should be here, not all the way up there. This one was correct. Then I checked the other side to make sure that that one was correct too. So 10 and 14. And if you go through all of them, you'll verify that they are actually all correct. Now, the same thing for the second one. So it should be zero and three. So there should be a dot here and there isn't. So this is not an option. This one, the dot is a little bit too far low, but it could be questionable. So I won't X that one out. Here it should be zero and three, but it's not, it's way up there. Here, this one does look correct. So now we're gonna go look at the back end. You have the stress rating of 10 and it should be at 14. Well, this is 15. So it should be a little bit higher up, closer to 15. It's not, it's down here on 10. So now I can outroll this one. Whereas this dot is right before the 15 bar. And so this is more consistent. And so it does happen to be that correct. Now, number eight is the same thing pretty much. It says, a random sample of 36 male college students is selected. Each student is asked his height to the nearest inch. And the heights are shown uh, in the frequency distribution, construct the histogram and frequency polygon for the data. So 
I did the same thing, but I noticed that over here with 66, they didn't have three marked, right? Three would have been over here. So this one was out here. Three is supposed to be over here and it's way up there. So this one was out here. These were marked at three. So I checked the back end, um, 75 and three, and they both were correct. So then I just picked one in the middle. I noticed that there was a big discrepancy with 68 and 69. Those seem to be the ones that are drastically different from one another. Um, so I chose 69 in the middle. So for 69, it should have been only at one and that made this one incorrect. So this one had to be the correct graph. Similarly, I did the same thing for the bottom ones. So for 66, it needed to be three. This one looked good. This one looked good. This one does not have a dot at three. So this one's out. This one does not have a dot at three. So this one is out. Then I looked on the back end at 75 and three. 75 and three, this is way, oh, maybe not. So this one was good. Um, and this one is good. So the back end didn't help me. So then I tried to figure out where was the biggest difference here. I mean, I could have looked at 72 because look at how 72 is up high and then down here it's real low. Or I could look at 69 because it's real high here, but real low there. So since I had already looked at 69, I knew it was 69 and one, and this is not marked at 69 and one, so it's not this one. So by process of elimination, we got the correct graph. Now number nine says, the histogram to the right shows the starting salaries rounded to the nearest thousand dollars for college graduates based on a random sample of recent graduates. Um, determine whether the following statement is true or false according to the graph. The percentage of starting salaries falling above those shown by any rectangular bar is equal to the percentage of starting salaries falling below the bar. Okay. Well, in order for the space above the bar and the space below the bar to be equal, that means that you basically have to be halfway um, to the top of the graph. Since the top of the graph is marked at 350, um, half of that would be 175. So basically you wanna look for any of these bars that are right on 175, okay? Um, and none of the bars are 175. You have uh, four, five of the bars that are below 175 and two of the bars above 175. So none of these bars are gonna meet the criteria where the space below the bar is equal to the space above the bar. Okay, just none of them are going to meet that criteria. So it is false. So this one is definitely out, and this one is definitely out. Now, this one says it's false because this is only true if there is an even number of bars. It doesn't matter how many bars there are, you're just looking to see if any of those bars go up to 175. Okay, and then so it's definitely not this one, it doesn't have to do with the number of bars. And then C says false because it is not true for any rectangular bar. And that is the case. None of these rectangular bars meet the criteria of being halfway between 350. So it is C. Now for number 10, it says a random sample of 40 college professors is selected from all professors at a university. The following list gives their ages. Uh, construct a stem and leaf plot for the data, complete parts A and B, determine the leaves for each corresponding stem, complete the table below. And it says use ascending order, which means we have to go from the lowest number to the highest number. So the first thing I did was I went through all of the data and looked for numbers that started with the two. So people who were that were in their 20s. And I underlined all of those. So of all the people that were in their 20s, the numbers, the second digits that I ended up with were in order from lowest to highest was one, four, five, seven. Then I went and looked for all the people that were in their thirties and I did like a, a little curved underline. Um, and so for those, all the people in the thirties, I wrote down all of those numbers. Now notice some of them repeated like four, five and eight. 
and I did have to write those twice to indicate that they did pop up twice. Then I did kind of like an upside down um, carrot symbol, right? And I identified all the people that were in their 40s and all the numbers that's digits. Then I did like a squiggly underneath and I typed in all of those digits, second digits, and then I circled the 60s that were left over and I typed in those digits, okay? They do have to be in order from lowest to highest um, and you do have to include the repeating ones. Now B says, what does the shape of the display reveal about the ages of the professors? And notice that this one is like really long, right? Compared to the others. So the fact that there are so many second digits to the first digit being four means there are a whole bunch of people in their forties. And so that's why we chose the option, the greatest number of college professors are in their forties. This is not true. If you were younger than 30, you cannot be a college. You already have four people who are younger than 30. Um, none of the college professors live to be 70. We don't know that. They probably just retired before they were 70. Um, and then none of the above. Well, that doesn't apply because B, B fits. Okay, moving on, we have about two more problems for this section. So here it says, the stem and leaf plots compared the ages of actors and actresses um, at the time they won an award. Complete parts A through D below. So you've got these stems, which this is the first digit of their age. And then these are the second digits of their age. Okay. So if you go this way, like 20, nothing, 39, 38, 37, 35, 33, 32, 32, 31, right? Or for the actresses, you would be 30, 30, 31, 31, 33, 33, 34, 34, 34, 35, 35, 37, 37, 38, right? So that's why I put my arrows there because it goes in this way for the actresses and it goes in this way for the actors, okay? Um, now for part A, it says, what is the age of the youngest actor to win the award? Now it does say actor, not actress. So we are looking here, okay? Now there's no one in their 20s, but there are quite a few people in their 30s. This is 39, that one is 31. So 31 is the lowest. So we're gonna say the youngest actor to win the award is 31 years old. Now B says, what is the age difference between the oldest and the youngest actress? to win the award. So the oldest is someone that was 83 and the youngest was someone in their 20s that was only 21. So I took the difference of those two and I got a difference of 62 years. What is the oldest age shared by two actors to win an award? So basically you're looking here and you wanna find where they have two digits that match. So no one, no actor was in their 80s that won the award. Only one person who was 78 won an award. A few people won the award when they were in their 60s, but they weren't the same age. But then you get to your 50s and you do have two people that were the same age. Both of them were 58. And so those are going to be the oldest ages. So what's the oldest age shared by two actors to win an award? It's 58 years old. Even though I do have, you know, two 32-year-olds, I have two 48-year-olds, two 47-year-olds, two 43-year-olds, two 42-year-olds, and two 40-year-olds. I also have two 58-year-olds, and that's the greater age or the oldest age. Now, D says, what differences do you observe between the two stem and leaf plots? What explanations can you offer the for these differences? So A says, there is a lower frequency of actors in their 40s and 50s than actor actresses. So in the 40s and 50s would be in this range. Okay. So there is a lower frequency of actors in their 40s and 50s and uh, actresses. Well, that's false. There's way more actors in their 40s and 50s than there are actresses. Okay. So this one is not true. 
Um, then the bottom one, I'm just going to read it because I already have this one marked. The bottom one says there is a higher frequency of actors in their 60s and 70s than actresses. So in the 60s and 70s, you don't have more. They're, they have the same number. There's three people in their 60s and one person each in their 70s. So there is not one that is higher or lower. They're the same. And then B says there is a higher frequency of actors in their 40s and 50s than actresses and a lower frequency of actors in their 20s and 30s than actresses. This could be explained by actors being older when they win an award. Um, and that is true. So there's a whole bunch more in their 40s and 50s than, and the actresses have more uh, tw uh, 20s and 30s. So that was option B. Now, last question here says, describe what is misleading in the visual display of data. It says world population in billions, and it has the years, well, it has the number of billions, 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, all the way to 9 billion, and then it has the years in which these happened, 19, or I'm sorry, yeah, 1904, 1927, 1960, 1974, 1987, 1999, 2002, 2026, and then 2043. I guess those other ones are predictions, right? And then it says choose the correct answer below. So A, it says part of the line, the time frame on the horizontal axis of the graph has been cut off. Yeah, but normally you do have part of the graph cut off. You just have the Part of the data that you need you don't include other numbers that you don't need so like we don't go go all the way back to bc if there were never ever one billion people at that time okay so it's not a a doesn't make sense um you can always set the parameters of your graph um b it says the title does not explain what is being displayed well that is incorrect it says it's the world population in billions and that's exactly what we see there um, C says the time intervals on the horizontal axis do not represent equal amounts of time. Now that is true. Notice that these are pretty much equally spaced out in between. Even though they're in a curve, they're, e they're equally spaced out. However, if you look at these time differences, they're not the same number of years that have gone by. So it that's the one thing that does make it look a little misleading because it's not like it's happening in this progression. It's taking quite a bit of time and now we're starting to speed up faster, but at the beginning it was going really slow and you can't really tell with the image here. And then part D says the bars on the vertical axis curve around the globe. Um, vertical axis is this way. Okay, that's the vertical axis. Um, and so basically what they're saying is that those little pillars are curving around the globe. That doesn't take away from their significance, okay? It would give you the same visual representation whether they were, um, instead of folded around like this, if they were just like this, you would still see the height increase in those pillars, okay? So that really isn't going, that isn't really misleading anything. It's the same visual representation. So the option to choose here would be C. The fact that the years are not evenly spaced out. Well, I mean, they are evenly spaced out, but they shouldn't be. There should be a bigger gap between 1904 and 1927. That's only what, 23 years versus 1999 and 2012, where that's only 13 year difference. Okay, well, that is the end of 9.1, and I will see you in the next video where we will get into, um, this is more about definitions and introductions and things like that. We'll actually get into the computation of statistics in the next section. I'll see you in the next video.